Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Um, I do want to talk about economic renewal, and specifically for communities that have built their foundations on natural resources. Um, what happens in communities that, that, that start that way is very, very typical. It's a very common experience. And um, I want to start by showing you what happens in other places so that we don't feel so bad about where we are um, and so that other communities don't feel bad about that. It's just a very common experience. And put that behind us and start looking forward. I want to present a three-part formula that is, I believe, part of the program that's going to take us towards the future. But first, I've got to start with getting the past behind us. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Cobalt Silver Kings. This is a professional hockey team from Cobalt, Ontario, played in the National Hockey Association, which is the association that evolved into the National Hockey League. This was a North American-wide professional hockey association, from, a professional team from Cobalt, Ontario, which at the time was Canada's silver capital. It was prosperous enough that it had a North American-wide professional sports team. This is the Renfrew Millionaires. The Renfrew Millionaires. They were a professional sports team. Renfrew, Ontario was big enough and prosperous enough to have a professional hockey team in the NHA. It ultimately moved to Montreal and then it moved to Toronto and this, these are the guys that became the Toronto Maple Leafs. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Sydney Millionaires. Professional Hockey Association, National Hockey Association from Sydney, Nova Scotia that went on to play in a Stanley Cup final in 1913. The town of Sydney, Nova Scotia at that time was prosperous enough and wealthy enough that they had a hockey team that played on the North American stage. And what's, in, what's in common between all these three teams or these three places, I should say, they were all communities that built their economy on natural resources. Cobalt is very small now. Renfrew continues to hold on. It's a common experience. I could go on for hours with, with very similar examples, but the point is, this experience of incredible prosperity that comes when you have a natural resource that's in demand, that results immediately in a, or, sorry, results in a decline when that, when that uh, resource is no longer quite so plentiful, is a very common experience. So we can put that behind us. You know, the fact that the mine may be empty should not anchor us to the past. There are no demons, there are no witch doctors, <laughs> there's nothing terrible that keeps us from moving forward into the future. The natural resources are less plentiful, but now we can move on. Ta-da! Let the future begin now. So what do we do? Um, there's a whole lot of talk about entrepreneurship these days. It's almost become a, an incredibly overused word. But what on earth does it mean? Can we open a pizza shop? Should I go grab a hammer and start becoming a carpenter? Um, it's not enough. It's not enough. I'm going to present three components that I think need to be in place in order for us to actually start rebuilding our economy based on entrepreneurship. And that's just one part of the picture, but this is an important part of the picture. Number one, it's got to involve exports, and I'm going to go into that in a whole lot of detail. We have to start creating businesses that are selling products and services to places away from our, our region. Number two, I believe there has to be a local connection. I believe that the entrepreneurs have to be rooted in some way to our community. I'm going to go into that as well. And third, it should involve innovation and creativity. The innovation and creativity opens a whole lot of doors, two especially that I'm going to talk to in a little more detail. But first, let's get back to the idea of exports. I'm amazed at how difficult it is sometimes for people to grasp the importance of an export-oriented business. Um, so the way I've been describing it to people is with a circle. You can draw that circle around any region, any municipality, any island, any state, anything you want if you want to understand how to grow wealth within the circle. So if I buy an automobile tomorrow, that automobile is not made here. It's not made here, it's made somewhere else. Therefore, the money that I paid for that automobile, much of that money goes outside of that circle, outside of that circle to somebody from elsewhere. If I buy a flat screen television, the money exits the circle. 
Anything I buy, if I buy this little clicker, this was not made here. The money that, was per that went into purchasing that left the circle, right? So we've got all kinds of money leaving the circle. We're buying things every single day. No issues with money going out of the circle. How do we get the money back into the circle? How does the cash come back into that circle? Well, right now, today, it really comes in two ways to a great extent. It comes in the form of a government check, and it comes in the form of a whole lot of migrant workers. We've got a lot of people locally that go earn money and bring some of that money back into the circle. Is that a sustainable plan? I suspect not. I don't think that that's going to be something that's going to keep us alive for a very long time, or any community. Um, you really need to find ways to bring cash back into that circle. Without it, continued decline is inevitable. So, number one, when you're thinking about new jobs, when you're thinking about new uh, entrepreneurial ventures, has to pass the test of does it bring cash back into that circle. Number two, uh, the local connection. Um, I'm going to combine the first two parts of that, history and commitment, together. Um, typically, certainly our local experience and in many other places, the ability to import an economy, the ability to take a business from somewhere else and pay somebody a huge amount of money to bring that business here has not been successful. And a big part of that is the commitment. Um, the cash that it takes to you know, operate some of these larger businesses to move them here is quite substantial. It's a very large investment. And the moment that cash is not there anymore, there isn't that commitment. Um, when you've got the local roots, like myself uh, and, and, and other uh, local entrepreneurs, your objective is more than just to earn a buck. Your objective is to actually contribute and, and to remain here, to be part of that. That commitment is absolutely huge. When you are building your life around the desire to create something for your community, your commitment is a whole lot deeper. And I think that's going to be a cr critical component. The other one, and this is just pure economics, but people don't think about this. Accumulation of capital. What on earth does that mean? If you've got a branch plant, if you've put a branch plant here with a, uh, a head office in New York, Tokyo, wherever, the money that's earned in that plant, yes, there's jobs, which are good things, and there's a tax that comes from having a plant here, but the profits, the really big money that's earned in those plants, that goes somewhere else. That goes back to head office. That doesn't stay inside the circle. It goes back to head office. And that means that money that's available to spend within the circle is gone. Money that's available to reinvest back inside the circle is gone. Okay, so you've just squandered an opportunity to bring cash back into the circle and keep it there by having that money go somewhere else. The third part, technology and innovation. Um, the ultimate buzzwords these days, but there's, there's really, a, it goes very deep when you understand why that's important. Part of it is that you're creating something that doesn't have a whole lot of competitive pressure. When you've, when you've created something that's truly new, that's truly valuable, you're not in the same position as somebody who's running a widget factory and has to compete with 10 other global widget factories, right? You can lose jobs, you can lose opportunities for a half a cent, for a half a cent per unit. Whereas if you're the people that have created something that is truly innovative and, and truly exciting to people, you're not going to lose sales because the widget manufacturer up the road undercut you by a penny. Right? So that's important. And the other part of it that's really important is just the sheer amount of dollars that are associated with some of these new technology ventures. The amount of money that could come into the circle as a result of technology and innovation is just so vast, you know, especially when you look at it in ratio to the investment that it takes to get some of these companies off the ground, uh, that, that it's actually staggering. And I'm going to give you one example. Um, this is a, a, a pulp and paper mill. It happens to be local, but it, it could be anywhere. This mill recently was sold for $34 million. The total value of assets and this pulp and paper mill was over a billion dollars. Billion dollars in tangible concrete assets that were sold for three cents on the dollar. And as a matter of fact, there was also loans associated with that that you know, totaled over $130 million. So in fact, it was sold for negative $100 million. 
<laughs> okay? Whereas there was a, a technology company that was started here locally um, that existed for about two and a half years, employed about four people, and was sold for $76 million. It was acquired for $76 million. So three to four employees, no tangible assets, they brought in $76 million compared to a $1 billion factory that was sold for $34 million. Is everybody starting to grasp the ratios? Is everybody starting to see the amount of money that can actually be made as a result of working in the new economy, a knowledge-based economy, as opposed to a traditional economy? It's absolutely staggering. Now, very quickly, something a little on the academic side. There's typically you know, three stages of an economy. Um, you start with natural resources, um, your oils and gas, the things that you take out of the ground. Um, and when, again, when they're gone, they're gone. Right? There's no fixing it. You can't make more coal. You can't make more oil. When it's gone, it's gone. Um, the industrial phase, you know, your, your, you know, your factories, your, your mass manufacturing factories, um, again, it's a whole lot of money. It's a very substantial investment. You're competing against China. You're competing against uh, well-established widget factories. When you get out to the far right, to the new economy, to the knowledge and creativity-based economy, Right? That's the place you want to be. That's where we are in, in, in you know, the most powerful economies in the world, and that's where the future is. Now, to get there, there are some things that are a little spooky compared to you know, what uh, natural resource-based economies are used to, and that's stability. Um, all economies go through four stages. Uh, economies and, sorry, and, and um, uh, businesses themselves. Uh, they, they're born, they grow, they mature, and eventually they die. Uh, in a coal mine, that could take a hundred years. So my dad, my granddad, all worked for the coal mine. Whereas when you're talking about tech startups, you're talking about life cycles as short as three months. <laughs> Companies that are born and, and fizzle out very quickly. Three months to maybe 30 years. So you're going to be seeing companies pop up and die, pop up and die, pop up and be acquired on a regular basis. That's a little unsettling for people who are used to seeing things that are very, very stable. But that's what we have to get used to. And think about it, that's a whole lot more robust. Instead of having you know, one giant machine that feeds everybody, we've got all kinds of little machines that are constantly coming and going. And, and that gives you a much more stable economy because the death of any single one of those doesn't devastate us. It's a much, much more stable, um, long-term sustainable way to design an economy. So let me quickly review this. The little devil, the little devil is there to remind us that we are not cursed, we are not doomed. We experience the same things that many, many other communities have experienced. Stop feeling bad about it. It's time to forget about it. It's just what happens. Move on. Entrepreneurship is a very, very important part of our future. But in order to do it right, it has to have these three components. We have to be bringing money back into the circle, and that happens through exports. Number two, I do strongly believe, and history suggests that I'm right, that having a local connection within the entrepreneur, within the company, is a very important component of the success of that particular business. And thirdly, innovation and creativity. Do we really want to try to go back into the past and hope we can relive it, or do we want to look towards the future? If we put those things together, I think there's a very strong possibility that we can rebuild our economy and that we get to stay here and that our kids can choose to stay here if they want to. Um, it's going to be a tough fight. I'm up for it. I know lots of people who are up for it, and I hope you'll join me. Thank you.